Stream more programs like this live and on demand with the PCN app in HD on your favorite device. Go to PCNTV.com to start streaming today. This program was underwritten by the Pennsylvania Bar Association and by the PA Bar Foundation. Welcome to the Pennsylvania Bar Association Young Lawyer Division Mock Trial State Finals. Uh, we welcome you here to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to the Dolphin County Courthouse. You two should be proud. These two teams should be proud of approximately 275 teams that began this competition in January, actually in November when the problem came out. Uh, you're the final two remaining. Um, it's been a good year, and it's been a, a long journey for you two teams. And on behalf of the Young Lawyers Division, congratulations. My name is Jonathan Coltash. I'm the immediate past chair of the Young Lawyers Division. With me is Jennifer Menekeni, the incoming chair of the Young Lawyers Division, and more important for today's proceedings, the co-chairs of the competition. Um, before we begin, I would like to just, on behalf of the association, thank a few of our partners. First, the Pennsylvania Bar Foundation, uh, who, whose generosity makes many, much of this weekend possible. To the Honorable Carolyn Mahalchek, U.S. District Magistrate Judge here in the Middle District of Pennsylvania, and most notably once a mock trial coach whose team made it to this round. So you have a, a good hand. You have a, a serious, dedicated mock trialer uh, on the bench this year. Um, the parents, the volunteers, the hundreds of volunteers that make this competition run uh, throughout the Commonwealth. The students, the teachers, and the school districts, you should all be very proud of all the work that you do. For those watching at home, I'll give you a little background on our case. This case is the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania v. Ray Schaefer. Pain. It can be unrelenting. It can destroy lives, and yet it leaves no mark and admits no objective measure of its existence. One person calls pain an eight, another calls it a four. Who is suffering more? What needs greater relief for longer? At the, front, at the frontiers of medicine, doctors and pharmaceutical companies once thought they had an answer. Derived from the same chemistry that gave morphine its life-changing power on the battlefield from Antietam to Normandy, opiate painkillers came into the scene in the early 1990s, and the dream of neurologists and pain management specialists seemed near fruition. That dream today has become our nightmare. The best estimates suggest that opiate painkillers were responsible for over 60,000 deaths last year alone. This is more than traffic deaths, more than firearm deaths, and more than cocaine and heroin put together. For the past two decades, pills have not had the same reputation as other street drugs, and the wide availability and legitimate uses for painkillers caused their abuse to spread as few other illegal substances have. As the opiate epidemic is a wide-ranging as it is devastating, rural areas are hit just as hard as inner cities, uh, inner city communities come under siege. This year's case takes place in the bleeding edge of the opiate crisis in this country. Hadley McAdoo, a beloved member of the Wissowee, Pennsylvania community, has died on the exam room table at the office of Dr. Ray Schaefer, a local pain management specialist. That cause of death is an empty syringe of hydromorphine, a potent narcotic mixed with Xanax already in McAdoo's blood. The question for trial arises, was, Schaefer administra was Schaefer's administration of the painkiller an act of mercy to a local hero in crippling pain? Or was it a criminal act of a doctor driven in desperation by financial ruin, far beyond the bounds of the acceptable medicine in a world which had, at last, recognized the, recognized the dangers posed by prescription opiate? The Commonwealth calls three witnesses to prove their case. Fran Kiesel, a nurse practitioner who observed Schaefer's practice at first hand, J.J. Teva, a local business person and friend of Hadley McAdoo, and Royal Copeland, a diversion investigator for the United States Drug Enforcement Administration. Schaefer responds in his or her own defense and calls an expert of his or her own, Ray Height, and one of McAdoo's closest friends in confidence, Sal Abbott. Trial is, is about to begin. You may bring in the jury, Madam Bailiff.
to today's final round of this mock trial competition. This is a I'm very excited to preside over this today, and I um, am. You all should be so proud to have to be here uh, this afternoon. This is going to be a an exciting round, and it should be fun too. And this is a an experience that is to help you get a greater understanding of our great legal system, which uh, I truly believe is the best we have in this world. And so thank you for participating in this today. I want to start by verifying first with the judging panel that none of you have seen either of the teams that are here today, and then ask you to briefly introduce yourself and where you're from. So. Hello, my name is Chuck Epolito. I'm the president of the Pennsylvania Bar Association. I'm also a partner and civil litigator at White and Williams. Good morning, I'm uh, Brett Binder. Uh, I have a small commercial litigation law firm and I'm also a magisterial district judge. Hi, my name is Bridget Alford. I am a shareholder with Marshall Dennehy, Warner Coleman and Goggin, an insurance defense litigation firm. Good morning, I'm David Trevaskis. I'm the pro bono coordinator for the Pennsylvania Bar Association. I'm also a member of the Pennsylvania Mock Trial Committee. Good morning, I'm Elena Koltach. I'm chair of the Young Lawyers Division of the Pennsylvania Bar Association, and I'm the executive director and legal counsel for the House Education Committee. Good morning, I'm Chester Korst. I'm a partner in the law firm of Williams and Treberg and Jones in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, and also a board member of the Pennsylvania Bar Foundation, which is one of the financial sponsors of these proceedings. Good morning, I'm Judge John Milton Young. I'm a judge of the Court of Common Pleas of the First Judicial District of Pennsylvania. My name is Lisa Siciliano. I'm the Family Court Administrator for the 23rd Judicial District and our Bar Association's Mock Trial Coordinator. Good morning, my name is Jim Sheehan. I'm currently retired, but before I was a civil litigator in a Harrisburg firm, a Philadelphia firm, general counsel to the governor and general counsel to Milton Hershey School. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, of our jury. At this time, I'm going to ask everyone to verify that your phones and any other electronic devices have been shut off or silenced. And if you must use one of your electronic devices, please leave the courtroom to do so. Please also try to limit the number of times that you enter and exit the courtroom as it does disrupt the proceedings. Uh, and only do so if you have to, or try to limit those interruptions to breaks when you need to. At this time, I'm going to ask the teams to introduce their participating net members by name and role, but please, I'm going to remind you, do not identify your team. So starting with the prosecution. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Ava Sinai. I will be performing the opening statement, the direct examination of J.J. Tiva, and the cross-examination of Ray Schaefer. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. My name is Julian Spiro. I will be performing the direct examination of Agent Royal Copeland and the cross-examination of Dr. Rai Haight. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Chloe Smith-Frank. I will be performing the direct examination of Fran Kelsey, the cross-examination of Sal Abbott, and the closing argument. Thank you. We are joined today by a few witnesses. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Sarah Miller, and I will be Fran Kelsey. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Javier Carbona, and I will be JJ Diva. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Brenda Dahl, and I will be Royal Copeland. Uh, we are also joined by our timekeeper. Good morning, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. For the defense? Good morning, Your, no Your Honor. My name is Elizabeth Arby, and I will direct Sal Abbott and Cross Fran Kelsey, along with give the closing argument. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Nicholas Klein, and I will be doing the direct examination of Dr. Rye Haight and the cross examination of Royal Copeland. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Laura Palmeter. I will be delivering the opening statement, directing Ray Schaefer and crossing J.J. Tiva. the timekeepers at this time that you should, uh, I will provide you an opportunity at the first break to verify that you are within uh, 15 seconds of each other and if there are any problems we should uh, check at that point, okay? Is there anything else that we need to do before there are the parties ready to proceed at this time? Yes, 
have a few brief pretrial matters. Okay. Uh, we asked your permission to move freely about the well. I have no problem with that. And we'd like to know your preference for approaching witnesses and opposing counsel's table. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, we asked your um, preferences for approaching witnesses and opposing counsel's table. Um, you can, I have no problem with you approaching the witness when it's, uh, when it's appropriate uh, during questioning. So that's, that's fine, or to show them an exhibit or something like that. I appreciate that. And the same with providing anything to counsel table. Yes, you, don't ha you don't have to ask every time. Yes, Your Honor. We'd also like to invoke rules of competition 4.7, which states that all witnesses are constructively sequestered with the exception of party representatives. Okay. Any objection to that? No, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. With that, the Commonwealth is ready to proceed. Okay. You may proceed. Your Honor, members of the jury, may it please the court. My name is Ava Sinai, and along with my co-counsel, we represent the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We are here today to prove to you that the defendant, Dr. Ray Schaefer, is guilty of drug delivery resulting in the death of Hadley McAdoo. We are going to show to you that the defendant was a doctor who was under too much pressure, prescribing too many opioids, and taking too few precautions. Our story begins with the defendant, a doctor who opened up a pain treatment clinic called Pain Away in Wiswee, Pennsylvania in 2010. Originally designed to provide the members of this small town with a holistic method of treating pain, the clinic quickly lost its footing due to catastrophic flood damage. As a result, the defendant developed reckless personal habits and began over-prescribing opioids. In 2014, the defendant began treating a woman named Hadley McAdoo, commonly referred to as Coach. The defendant was prescribing the highly addictive oxycodone to Coach McAdoo for nearly three years. On December 16, 2016, the de defendant gave Coach McAdoo a strong shot of hydromorphone without taking the time to check and see what other medications she might be on. Later that night, Coach McAdoo was found dead in her home. It is stipulated that she was killed by a combination of the opioids she was receiving from the defendant and Xanax. Now, as the Commonwealth, we hold the burden of proof today which means that we have to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. If at the end of today's trial, you find that the, either the defendant did not act in good faith or that she failed to act in accordance with treatment principles accepted by a responsible segment of the medical profession, you must find her guilty. Only one of these is needed for conviction. Now, a responsible segment of the medical profession does not mean every licensed doctor. It just means that good, diligent doctors wouldn't agree with the defendant's actions. We're going to call three witnesses before you today. You will hear from Fran Kelsey, nurse practitioner at Painway, who will tell you how when the clinic hit financial troubles, the defendant began prescribing more and more opioids in the very same town where she was once practicing holistically. At the same time, the defendant was spending less and less time with her patients. Next, you will hear from JJ Teva, bank employee and confidant of the defendant, who will tell you how the defendant's mental state was dramatically affected by the downfall of pain away and how she began drinking. Mr. Teva will also tell you how Coach McAdoo's mental health was visibly declining. He tried to warn the defendant of this, but he received no response. Lastly, you will hear from DEA Special Agent and Narcotics Investigator Royal Copeland. Agent Copeland will testify to the red flags he found in his investigation including how pain away skyrocketed above the national average, both in their opioid prescription rates and the potency of these prescriptions. Agent Copeland will also tell you how the defendant could and should have known that Coach McAdoo was taking Xanax. The defendant could have learned this simple fact by administering a urine test or by checking a database easily accessible to all Pennsylvania doctors. The defendant did neither. Now, the defense will also call three witnesses today, but if you listen closely to their testimony, you'll hear that they too paint a picture of a doctor who's under too much pressure, prescribing too many opioids, and taking too few precautions. After hearing the facts of today's case, it will be clear that we will have met our burden and shown to you that the defendant did not act in good faith and that she did not act in accordance with treatment principles accepted by a responsible segment of the medical profession. The defendant was a doctor who was under too much pressure between the bankruptcy of her clinic and a medical malpractice suit. 
the defendant was a doctor who was prescribing too many opioids. You will hear how her prescription rates started at around 10%, but climbed to over 80%. And finally, the defendant was a doctor who was taking too few precautions. She never used urine testing at her clinic. She failed to check the database, and she didn't even ask Coach McAdoo whether she was taking Xanax. At the conclusion of today's trial, my co-counsel, Chloe Smith-Frank, will come before you and ask that you find in favor of the Commonwealth and find Dr. Ray Schaefer guilty of drug delivery resulting in the death of Hadley McAdoo. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Is the defense ready to proceed? May it please the court, opposing counsel, members of the jury. When firefighters race into a burning building, they use their training and experience to assess the situation and they form their best judgment on how to proceed. When soldiers patrol streets in foreign combat zones, they use their training and experience to assess the situation and they form their best judgment on how to proceed. When pilots encounter dangerous flying conditions, they use their training and experience to assess the situation and they form their best judgment on how to proceed. On December 16, 2016, Dr. Ray Schaefer was faced with a difficult situation. Using her medical training and experience, she attempted to relieve her patient's pain. Her motivation was compassion. Her judgment was consistent with the standards set by her medical profession. Because the ultimate outcome was unfortunate, the prosecution has charged Dr. Ray Schaefer with a crime. Good afternoon, members of the jury. My name is Lauren Palmiter. I, along with my co-counsel, Nicholas Klein and Elizabeth Arby, represent the defendant in tonight's case, Dr. Ray Schaefer. Today, the prosecution bears the burden of proving their case to you beyond a reasonable doubt. This means they must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that on December 16, 2016, Dr. Ray Schaefer either failed to act in good faith or fail to act in accordance with the treatment principles accepted by a responsible segment of the medical profession. But members of the jury, do not judge my client with the benefit of hindsight. Judge Dr. Safer under the circumstances that existed with her encounter with Coach Hadley McAdoo on the afternoon of December 16, 2016. The defense bears no burden of proof tonight, and the defense does not need to call a single witness to the stand. But we intend to call three witnesses to prove to you, members of the jury, that Dr. Schaefer acted in both good faith and within the treatment principles accepted by a responsible segment of the medical profession. Our first witness tonight is Dr. Ray Schaefer, and she will tell you about her extensive education and training to become a physician specializing in pain management. Dr. Schaefer will tell you that she opened a clinic called Painway here in Wisby in 2010. And she will tell you that Coach Hadley McAdoo a 73-year-old who suffered from chronic and, at times, debilitating pain, became her patient in 2014. And Dr. Schaefer will tell you that on the afternoon of December 16, 2016, Coach showed up at her office showing signs of extreme pain. Now, members of the jury, I ask you to pay close attention to the testimony about Coach's presentation on this day. Unfortunately, Coach did not provide accurate information to Dr. Schaefer. When asked what other medication she was taking, Coach failed to say that she was taking Xanax. Faced with a patient in extreme agony and not knowing that that patient had breached the trust relationship with her physician, Dr. Schaefer used her medical training and experience in administering pain relief medication. Our second witness tonight is Ms. Sal Abbott. She's Painaway's accountant. And she will tell you that by 2016, any financial problems cited by the prosecution were overcome. Now, Ms. Sal Abbott was also a very close friend of Coach Hadley McAdoo. And she will relay some interesting observations she made about Coach shortly before her death. And our third witness tonight is defense expert, Dr. Rai Haight. Now, keep in mind, members of the jury, that the defendant herself, Dr. Ray Schaefer, and the defense expert, 
Dr. Rye Haight are the only two doctors that will testify before you tonight. And Dr. Haight will later tell you that Dr. Schaefer's judgment and actions on December 16th, 2016, were fully within the treatment principles accepted by a responsible segment of the medical profession. Now, finally, members of the jury, I ask you, pay attention to the circumstances surrounding Coach McAdoo's death. And ask yourselves what those circumstances tell you about her death. At the conclusion of this case, my co-counsel, Elizabeth Arby, will have the opportunity to present a closing argument to you. And she will tell you, as I will tell you right now, that the prosecution's case is plagued with reasonable doubt. And Dr. Schaefer was unfairly targeted. And as a defense, we ask you to find this physician who used her medical training and experience not guilty of the charge against her. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Is the prosecution ready to proceed? Yes, ma'am. Commonwealth calls Fran Kelsey to the stand. that the testimony you're about to give will be faithfully and truthfully and in accordance with the rules of the mock trial competition? Thank you. Be seated. Thank you. May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Good morning, Ms. Kelsey. Good morning. Could you please introduce yourself to the members of the jury? I'm Fran Kelsey. I was the nurse practitioner at Pain Away, Dr. Schaefer's pain management clinic. How did you come to begin working at Pain Away? I met Dr. Schaefer at Calmia. I was finishing my master's of science in nursing, and she was finishing her residency. She came to me with an idea for a new type of clinic, one focused on Eastern medicine. What was the business like when you first began working there? At first, things were quiet. It was just Dr. Schaefer and I in an old car dealership right off of Wiswee trying to save the world one patient at a time. We believed that a healthy mind could help constitute a healthy body, so we didn't run any urine tests. Did the business expand at any point while you worked there? Yes. We kept getting more patients, so we decided to expand to a larger space to better accommodate our patients. How did that expansion go, Ms. Kelsey? Things in the new space went well at first, but then the famous NASCAR driver, Patricia Danica, filed a lawsuit against the practice, and Superstorm Sandy absolutely devastated the practice. What happened with Pain Away after that? After that, Dr. Schaefer realized that we didn't have flood insurance, so she was forced to declare bankruptcy and close the clinic. Did you ever work with the defendant again? Yes. About a half a year after Pain Away closed, Dr. Schaefer called me and said that she wanted to open Pain Away again, but that it couldn't be like it was before, and it wasn't. We started seeing more patients for shorter times. Dr. Schaefer started prescribing more opioids, and our patients started paying in cash, but we still didn't do any urine testing. Ms. Kelsey, I'd like to ask you a few questions uh, relating to general medical practice. Are you familiar with the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program? Yes, the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program or the PDMP, is a database which allows doctors to see what prescriptions their patients are on. All right. Now, Ms. Kelsey, while you worked at Pain Away, did you have occasion to interact with Hadley McAdoo? I did. Hadley McAdoo, or Coach, as most of us who knew her called her, came in of January of 2014. She claimed she was suffering from chronic pain. Dr. Schaefer ran a series of CT scans and x-rays but found no evidence of muscular tendon damage. She determined Coach to be suffering from chronic, I mean, phantom pain. And to your knowledge, Ms. Kelsey, how did the defendant treat this phantom pain? Dr. Schaefer wrote Coach a script for hundreds of doses of oxycodone, and after that, Coach was always around. Once, I even saw Coach giving Dr. Schaefer a wad of $100 bills. More prejudicial than probative. The situation in which Nurse Kelsey is relying to is an alleged event in which Dr. Schaefer and Coach McAdoo were outside of the Painaway Clinic, therefore not referencing anything to the day in question of December 
of December 16th. Also, this is an alleged event. Nobody is able to testify to the exact amount of money that was in this wad of cash. And it's also more prejudicial because it is enforcing a different image in the mindset of the jury, saying that this was some illegal action happening outside of Painway. Therefore, it's more prejudicial and irrelevant. Your Honor, if I may, Ms. Kelsey is not drawing any legal conclusion as to the exchange of this money. In addition, the probative value of Ms. Kelsey's uh, uh, vision of this exchange substantially outweighs any prejudice it might cause the jury. One of the prongs the Commonwealth has to prove today is an absence of good faith. And the interactions a doctor has with their patients while treating them goes directly to the faith of the doctor during that treatment. Additionally, as Ms. Kelsey previously testified, more and more patients at Pain Away had begun paying in cash, and this is simply another example of this occurring. Therefore, it's extremely relevant to Dr. Schaefer's treatment of Hadley McAdoo. Your Honor, if I may, yet again, the prejudicial value substantially outweighs the probative value. Saying that a doctor and the doctor's patient are outside the facility, which is not in happening in the day in question, December 16th, that's not irrelevant to that day, exchanging wads of cash in which no one can testify to, not even Nurse Kelsey can tell you the exact amount of money that was there. For example, it could have been ones, hundreds, for all we know, but the fact that nobody can testify to the exact amount and is ins insinuating a different image into the minds of the jury is more prejudicial between a doctor and the doctor's patient outside the pain facility exchanging money. Your Honor, if I may, the amount of money in this case is not a uh, question here. The issue is whether or not Dr. Schaefer was interacting with her patient during her treatment in a way that constituted good faith. And any interaction between the doctor and patient, specifically relating to monetary payments, goes directly to the faith of the doctor when treating the patient. Your Honor, if I may, yet again, this happened outside of the pain facility, not on the day in question, December 16th. Therefore, it is completely irrelevant and more prejudicial because it is informing the jury that some illegal action and or not appropriate action that could happen inside the facility was happening behind, uh, behind the curtains. Um, thank you for your argument on that. I'm going to allow the question and she may answer the question. Thank yes, you. Your Honor. Would you like me to re-ask the question? Yes, please. What did you observe about Dr. Schaefer's treatment of Hadley McAdoo? Dr. Schaefer wrote Coach a script for hundreds of doses of oxycodone, and after that, Coach was always around. Once, I saw Coach giving Dr. Schaefer a wad of $100 bills. Ms. Kelsey, over the course of Coach McAdoo's treatment, what did you observe about Dr. Schaefer's use of the prescription drug monitoring program? Dr. Schaefer, to my observations, did not check the prescription drug monitoring program for Coach. I'd like to ask you a few questions about the day of Coach McAdoo's death, December 16th, 2016. What do you remember about that day? It was terrible. Coach came in, she was sweating, she was shaking, and she couldn't move her left arm because of the pain. I had filled out her intake sheet and was in the process of asking her if she was on anything and about to check the PDMP when Dr. Schaefer called Coach in and told me to take a break. In all of the years that I've been working for Shin, and gave her a shot of hydromorphone, which was the strong, strongest dose of narcotics she has ever given to one of our patients. And what was the outcome of that treatment? Coach died. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Kelsey, I'd like to clarify a few things for the jury. On December 16, 2016, it was perfectly legal for Dr. Schaefer to prescribe an opioid without referring to the PDMP, correct? It was legal, but in around three weeks, it would not be. But it's still perfectly legal. It was legal, but the checking the PDMP as mandatory would be law. And Ms. Major. Kelsey, it was also a perfectly legal injection dose that Dr. Schaefer administered to Coach Hadley McAdoo on that date, correct? Legal, but on the higher end of the FDA guidelines. Now, it's true you describe pain as a funny thing, correct? That's true. You say it's funny because someone can be in pain with no actual injury. Isn't that true? Yes. And you're employed uh, at a pain clinic, correct? I am in, yes. As a nurse practitioner? I am a nurse practitioner. Now, you'd agree with me that there are certain limitations you have to treating a patient in pain, correct? That's true. Your treating patients in pain is difficult because, as you said before, what one person's pain we can't really measure pain objectively. You're unable to prescribe opioids to a patient reporting in pain. Isn't that true? No, I leave that to the doctor. Ray Schaefer is, in fact, a doctor, isn't she? Yes, she's Dr. a doctor. Dr. Ray Schaefer is able to prescribe opioids to a patient reporting in pain. Isn't that true? 
Yes, she is. Dr. Ray Schaefer is able to do so because she furthered her education in the fields of studying those medications for the ability to do that. Isn't that true? That is true. Now That's I'd like to, under the purview of a doctor's education. Now, I'd like to discuss 2014 when Coach McAdoo came to the pain weight clinic. She came because of a shooting pain in her arm. Isn't that true? Yes, she was in terrible pain. And initially, there were CTs, MRIs, and even x-rays ran to pinpoint the precise location of this pain. Yes, as we do with all of our patients who come in with pain that they can't identify, we try and find out what an identifiable cause of their pain would be. And you would agree with me that there was no muscular or tendon damage revealed on any of those scans? No. So it is true that Coach McAdoo in 2014 could be in pain with no actual injury, correct? She was suffering from phantom pain, yes. Now, I'd like to discuss December 16th, 2016 with you. Coach McAdoo called first thing in the morning because of this crippling pain. Isn't that true? She did. And you would agree with me, she sounded flustered in that phone call. Isn't that true? She did sound flustered. But, she was in pain. But you didn't tell her to immediately go to an urgent care, did you? No, I did not. You didn't tell her to call an ambulance for this crippling pain either, did you? No. In fact, you scheduled her as a tack-on patient all the way at the end of the workday. Isn't that true? Yes, because we had a particularly busy day. We have a lot of patients. We're a pain clinic, so all of our patients are coming to us in pain, and all of them have a great need to see Dr. Schaefer. But you would agree with me that this situation was rather urgent. Yes, but a lot of our situations are urgent because we're a pain clinic. And when Coach finally came in, you noticed that she was sweating in pain, wasn't she? She was. She was shaking in pain, wasn't she? She was. In fact, she couldn't move her arm to wipe the sweat off her forehead. Isn't that true? No, she could not. And it was this, terrible. And at this moment, you started asking her what medication she was on, correct? I did. I was filling out her intake sheet, like I do with all my patients. And you were writing these medications down. Isn't that true? I was. But Coach never told you she was on Xanax, did she? No, she did not, but she was also in a pretty bad condition, so she might not have remembered. And at this point, Dr. Schaefer took her patient back to the room, correct? After ordering me to take a break, yes. And you were no longer present for the situation Dr. Schaefer faced in that room, were you? No, I was not. Dr. Schaefer had ordered me to take a break. What you do know is that 20 minutes later, Coach McAdoo walked out of that very same room, didn't she? She did. She was no longer sweating in pain, was she? I don't know if she was in pain or not. She was not sweating to my observations. She was no longer shaking, was she? No. In fact, she walked out of that room smiling because she was pain free. Wouldn't you agree with me? She was smiling, yes. And now one last question. Unlike Dr. Schaefer, you have never had to make the decision whether or not to prescribe an opioid to a patient reporting in crippling pain, have you? No, because I am not a doctor and I leave those decisions to the doctor. No further questions, Your Honor. Is there a redirect? No, Your Honor. Thank you. You may sit down. Thank you. Yeah. I would just ask at this time, it's the only time I'll do this, but if the timekeepers <laughs> could check with each other to verify that you're. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I will not be asking again, so just if, I trust that you guys will stay on top of that. Thank you. The next witness? Yes, Your Honor. The Commonwealth calls Mr. J.J. Teva to the stand. Thank you. May I proceed? You may. Good morning, Mr. Teva. Could you please introduce yourself to the jury? Of course. I'm J.J. Teva, the commercial and personal loan manager at First Wiswe Bank. Could you explain your job at the bank? I'm actually quite important. You see, I decide who gets money and who doesn't. It's up to me if you can open up a business or buy a house. Can you explain how you came to know the defendant? It's a funny story. You see, back in 2010, Shafe, that's what I call him, her, came to me for a $100,000 loan to open up a pain clinic in Wiswee. But on paper, the business plan was trash. I mean, she wanted to open up some touchy-feely pain clinic out of an old Chevy dealership. Did you give her the loan? Well, you'd have no reason to know this, but I used to be a tennis champion in my youth. But my career was cut short when I got a bad case of tennis elbow. So I told Shafe if she could fix my tennis elbow, I'd give her the loan. And it worked so well, I gave her twice what she asked for. What was your relationship like with the defendant after this? Well, it started to grow. I started recommending her left and right, and we even became pretty good friends. From your job at the bank, did you have a chance to observe how Painway was doing over time? 
yeah, it really took off. Um, and they even had to move into a bigger place. Although Shafe did have to leverage her home with a second mortgage and open a large home equity line of credit. What was the defendant like as Painway was growing? Well, it was a big place. She was stressed, overwhelmed. How could you tell that she was stressed and overwhelmed? See, earlier on in our friendship, she had confided in me that she didn't drink, and now she started drinking. To bring up Dr. Ray Schaefer's past drinking? Uh, Your Honor, we're not saying that this is a bad act or character evidence in any way. Um, we're simply outlining a change in behavior on the defendant, which is um, going to the stress that she was feeling at the time because of her financial problems. Your Honor, if I may, the prosecution cannot prove that Dr. Ray Schaefer was under the influence on December 16, 2016. Therefore, bringing up the testimony about alcohol is more preju prejudicial than it is probative. Your Honor, we're not using this for, for propensity purposes. We're not trying to say that Dr. Schaefer was intoxicated while treating Coach McAdoo. However, this change in behavior is indicative of the stress, which could be a motive for acting in bad faith in um, attempts to gain money while treating patients. Your Honor, if I may, I see that the prosecution is trying to prove that this, cha this change of behavior included the alcohol, and that's what I'm saying. It's more prejudicial than it is probative. Drinking the alcohol is an inflammatory term, and it should not be allowed in court today. It is not relevant to December 16th, 2016. I'm going to sustain the objection as to the alcohol. The witness is free to testify about change in behavior. And Your yes, Honor, sir. pursuant to Rule 611E, I move to strike that from the testimony. So stricken. Yes, Thank Your Honor. You. Yes, Your Honor. Did Painway face any challenges over time? Yeah, in 2012, it all started to fall apart. What happened in 2012? Well, that's when Hurricane Sandy hit. It devastated the clinic. Shafe even told me she didn't know about flood insurance, so now she was $3 million in debt and declared bankruptcy. How did the defendant respond to the bankruptcy of her clinic? You see, that's where I saw something weird. I looked into her finances because I was still her loan manager, and her spending habits had stayed the same from when she was a successful doctor getting patients from around the country to when she was bankrupt. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to Coach McAdoo. Did you know her? Yeah, uh, I knew Coach McAdoo. Everyone did. Uh, I even recommended her to Schaefer in 2014. Did you have any concerns about her being a patient of Dr. Schaefer's? Not at first, but me and Schaefer got into a pretty big fight, and Schaefer said that Coach McAdoo was a cash flow, one of her own patients, a cash flow. What did you do after Dr. Schaefer called Coach McAdoo a cash flow? Well, of course, I thought Coach had to know because, I mean, it was insane. So I called her up and I heard something even worse. Coach told me that she got hers and I get mine. Your Honor, under 804B3, this is a statement against interest with a declarant who is unavailable due to death. It is a statement against interest because it has a tendency to expose Coach McAdoo to criminal liability since she is admitting to mishandling opioids. Your Honor, if I may, this is not a statement against interest. As Coach McAdoo said, I get mine and she gets hers, and it's for her own interest. So I fail to see how it is an exception to hearsay. Because this exposes her criminal liability, she is admitting to a criminal act in this statement. It is a statement against interest. Your Honor, if I may, may I respond? Yes, you may. I don't feel as though it has a connotation of legal, I'm sorry, legal uh, troubles for this statement, saying that she, she gets her opioids, and I don't know what the other statement is supposed to mean, but I feel to see still how it's a statement against interest. Um, I'm going to uh, overrule the objection and allow the statement. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Would you like me to re-ask? Sure. What did you do after Dr. Schaefer um, called Coach McAdoo a cash flow? Well, as I said, I called her up, and I heard something worrying that she gets hers, and I get mine. Did you ever see Coach McAdoo in person after the day you recommended her to Dr. Schaefer? Yeah, at the 2015 Rotary Club Annual Gala with Schaefer. What was Coach McAdoo's behavior like at that gala? The Rotary Club Gala happened years before Coach McAdoo's death. Your Honor, if my witness would be allowed to continue, he would go to testify about how Coach McAdoo was visibly in a bad state. Given that Dr. Schaefer was present at this gala, she, should have, she would have observed the state and then continued to treat Coach McAdoo later, knowing her declining mental health. This goes directly to bad faith, which is one of the prongs we have to prove in today's case. Your Honor, if I may, bad faith only happens on December 16, 2016. The prosecution's burden is only for that specific date. The Rotary Club Gala happened years before Coach McAdoo's death and was during the beginning of her treatment with Dr. Ray Schaefer. So I fail to see how it is relevant in court tonight. If I may, Your Honor, mm -hmm. the defense is 
claiming that Dr. Schaefer's knowledge about Coach McAdoo were solely coming in from the intake sheet or from the ward of the patient herself. However, this goes to show that Dr. Schaefer had knowledge about Coach's condition based off this gala, which would go to the knowledge that Dr. Schaefer was using when treating Coach McAdoo on the day in question. And how, how, long, how long ago was it the gala prior to the, the date of death? About a year, Your Honor. Anything else? No, Your Honor, I stand by my objection. Okay, I'm going to um, allow the allow the question and the testimony. Yes, the objection is overruled. Yes, Your Honor. What was Coach's behavior like at this gala? She came in unannounced and uninvited, sat at the speaker's chair, and started playing with the cups and forks like they were xylophones. Xylophones. I mean, I was horrified, and of course I was concerned for Coach. I mean... This just wasn't like her. Did you do anything about these concerns? Yeah, I call, I sent Shaif a message and uh, warning her about my concerns and her declining state, but I got no response, none. Thank you, Your Honor, no further questions. Cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Teva. I'm just going to ask you a few questions. You're not a physician, are you? Nope. And as law manager, you've never had to make the decision whether to prescribe opioids to a patient reporting pain. Absolutely you? not. But that's not to say that you yourself haven't experienced some pain. Isn't that right? Yeah. Uh, as I said earlier, Shafe cured my tennis elbow. In fact, as someone who has experienced pain, it can be quite crippling, can't it? Yeah, it can. In fact, Mr. Teva, you couldn't type on a keyboard without experiencing extreme pain. Now isn't that right? Yeah, at some point it got real bad. So you sought treatment from Dr. Ray Schaefer, correct? Yeah. And when you asked her to heal your pain, she did so, correct? Yeah, with some acupuncture and some weird ointments. I don't know exactly what happened, but it was gone within the day. Mr. Tiva, for the first time in a decade, because of Dr. Ray Schaefer, you finally felt some relief. Isn't yeah, that with right? acupuncture, not opioids. Now, Mr. Teva, I want to move to early 2014. It was then that you bumped into Coach McAdoo at the market, correct? Yeah. And you made some personal observations about her, correct? Yeah, I did. She seemed awful. I mean, she seemed sad and desperate. Mr. Teva, you thought Coach McAdoo looked depressed, didn't you? Yeah. It was awful to see, and I saw that Shafe's treatment was doing nothing for her. Mr. Tiva, this was before. Worse. This was before Coach McAdoo saw Dr. Schaefer, correct? In I met her twice at a market. Which one are you explaining? The first time in 2014, Mr. Tiva. Oh, when I first recommended her. And she was depressed then, correct? Yeah. In fact, Coach McAdoo told you much. then that she was in a ton of pain. Isn't that right? Yeah, and then that's why I recommended her to Shafe. I thought that she would get some acupuncture treatments like I did and end up feeling better than ever. Now, Mr. Tiva, I want to move to the summer of 2016, six months before Coach's death. Once again, you bumped into Coach, correct? Yeah. And once again, you made some observations about her, right? Yeah, that's what I was talking about before. She looked more depressed than ever. She was, she looked completely destroyed and Mr. she Tiva, was asking me to later, fill her anxiety meds. Mr. Tiva, two years later, you still thought she looked terrible. Isn't that right? Yeah, so much worse than before. It was, in fact, it was this startling. Time, in fact, this least. time, Coach McAdoo told you she was suffering from depression. Isn't that right? Yeah. This time, Coach told you she was suffering from anxiety. Isn't that right? Yeah, and then she asked me to help her fill her anxiety meds. And she told you she was suffering from all of this on top of her pain. Isn't that right, Mr. Tiva? Yeah, I can't. I couldn't believe that even with all the treatment, Shafe had done nothing. Now, Mr. Tiva, it was six months before Coach's overdose that she told you she was depressed, correct? Yeah. And you said you sent a Facebook message to Dr. Ray Schaefer, correct? Yes. You sent it to an ad service account. Isn't that right? Well, I tried calling her and texting her before, and I got no response, so Mr. Tiva, I did a last resort. You have no way of knowing that my client even saw this message. Isn't that right? I had sent her messages before. I got no response, so I just Mr. tried Tiva, to redirect you back to my question. You have no idea if Dr. Ray Schaefer saw that message. Isn't that correct? No. Finally, Mr. Tiva, you believe that Dr. Ray Schaefer is well-meaning. Isn't that right? 
the beginning, yeah. So you say in your sworn affidavit that Dr. Schaefer is well-meaning, right? At the beginning, yeah. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. Thank you. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Thank you. You can sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Prosecution's next witness? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Commonwealth would like to call Agent Royal Copeland to the stand. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Copeland. How are you doing today? Good afternoon. Could you please introduce yourself to the jury? My name is Royal Copeland. I'm a special agent for the Drug Enforcement Administration. And could you tell the jury a bit about your uh, educational background? Certainly. I received my bachelor's in criminal justice from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and then I received my master's in public health from the University of Phoenix. This was no small feat coming from public housing in the South Side. And what work experience do you have? Well, believe it or not, after I graduated, I actually worked for the Chicago PD a couple years, a couple more in major crimes. After that, I was noticed by the DEA. They uh, suggested I join a task force investigating the Robert Taylor homes. That's public housing overrun with drugs and gangs. Anyway, I was very successful in that, and I actually was uh, further promoted to diversion investigator. What, uh, what is drug diversion exactly? Well, uh, it's essentially a diversion investigator's job to stop legal drugs from being used in a way other than how they were prescribed. To do this, diversion investigators rely on historical data, statistical analysis. It's all about the numbers. You see, in diversion investigation, there is no smoking gun. Uh, Your Honor, at this point, I move to qualify Agent Copeland as an expert in narcotics investigation with a specialty in drug diversion. Your Honor, I do have an objection to the specialty in drug diversion. Uh, while I have no objection to the witness's qualifications as a diversion investigator, I have, do have an objection to the relevance of the diversion testimony in this case. The charge is about whether or not Dr. Schaefer acted in good faith or in accordance with a responsible segment of the medical profession on December 16, 2016. As opposing counsel just stated, drug diversion is about, about legal drugs being used for a purpose other than which they were prescribed. That is not the charge in this case, and that is not the prosecution's burden to prove. Uh, Your Honor, if I may be heard, Please. drug diversion, as well as the uh, general pattern of the pain away clinic and the faith uh, in which the Dr. Schaefer acted throughout his treatment of not only Coach Hadley McAdoo, but also all his other patients, go directly and are highly relevant to the treatment he administered on the day in question. Your Honor, may I respond? Yes. Ma the only definition that opposing counsel has provided for drug diversion is legal drugs being used for a purpose other than which they are prescribed, which is not the question at hand today. If opposing counsel would like to say that it involves all of the different scenarios surrounding Dr. Schaefer's clinic, then I ask that they lay that foundation before he be deemed an expert in this field. Your Honor, if I may. Yes, uh, please. Uh, the use of Ill uh, legally prescribed drugs in an illegal or immoral fashion uh, is highly relevant to the treatment that Coach McAdoo received, not only on December 16th, but also throughout, her, again, her whole tenure at Painaway. So I'm clear, the objection is not that he be qualified as an expert, just into the specialty as uh, in narcotics diversion? Yes, Your Honor. I'm going to conditionally sustain that objection and allow counsel to more, I will, uh, there's no objection to this witness being qualified as an expert generally, but um, in terms of the narcotics diversion thing, I think that some more foundation would be necessary. Yes, sir. Sorry. Yes, sir. But I will allow further questioning on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Now, uh, did drug diversion pertain to a uh, pain away not only um, uh, relevant to Coach Hadley McAdoo's treatment, but also throughout? Uh, Your Honor, I did not imply an answer. This is an open-ended question. Uh, you, you, um, I'm going to sustain or overrule that objection. You can ask the question. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, again, Agent Copeland, does drug diversion pertain to Dr. Schaefer's treatment of not only Coach Hadley McAdoo, but also all her patients at Painaway? 
It most certainly does. You see, uh, drug diversion talks about the good faith of a doctor over the course of an entire treatment and treatment of multiple individuals. So uh, whether or not a doctor is engaging in drug diversion goes directly to how they would uh, behave in particular instances and with the patient at hand today. Uh, Your Honor, at this point I move to qualify Agent Copeland as not only uh, an expert in narcotics investigation, as I believe he is already qualified, but also drug diversion. No objection. Okay. He is so qualified. You Thank may proceed. You, Thank you. Agent Copeland, did you review all relevant information in today's case? I did. And are these the documents and materials you normally review when uh, forming your expert opinions? They are. Your Honor, I, ex I have Exhibit 1, permission to approach opposing counsel on the witness. You may. Would you guys like a copy? Agent Copeland, now, what is this document exactly? This is the historic holistic prescription chart. It compares the data of pain away's prescription rates, dosage, average MME, with that of the national averages. And how did you obtain this document? This was obtained by a lawful investigation of the pain away clinic. It is an official pain away kept document. And is it a fair and accurate copy? It is. Your Honor, at this point I move to enter Exhibit 1 into evidence and publish to the jury. Any objection? Your Honor, I do have an objection. While I'm aware of the authenticity of this document under the stipulations, I believe that any of the years on this document that do not include the years that Coach Hadley McAdoo was being treated at Dr. Schaefer's clinic are irrelevant in this case. Uh, for instance, uh, Coach McAdoo didn't start receiving treatment at Pain Away until 2014. And so any years before that would have clearly nothing to do with the case at hand today, whether she acted in good faith when treating Coach McAdoo. Your Honor, if I may, if okay. opposing counsel is making a general relevance argument, I would like to first state that the bar for relevance is incredibly low. Anything that will either make a fact more or less likely is considered relevant in a court of law. Furthermore, again, like we've previously established, we are using this to show the pattern and increase in the opioid prescriptions of Dr. Fa Schaefer, which would go directly to how he is treating Coach Hadley McAdoo on the day she died. Your Honor, may I respond? You may. This is not just a general relevance objection. I understand that this could encompass more than just one day, but to allow evidence in that encompasses treatment outside of Coach Hadley McAdoo's treatment at Painaway would be completely irrelevant because Co Coach McAdoo wasn't even a patient at Painaway at the time, and that is who this case is about. It's about whether Dr. Shaver acted in good faith when treating Coach McAdoo, even if it involved more time than just December 16th. Uh, Your Honor, if I may, I would like to read in Rule 401, the test for relevant evidence. Evidence is considered relevant if it has any tendency to make a fact more or less probable than it would be without the evidence, and the fact is of consequence in determining the action. Dr. Schaefer's treatment before and after she began prescribing more and more opioids goes directly to both her practice, again, of coach, uh, in her treatment of Coach McAdoo and her treatment of all her patients, really. May I respond? You may. That evidence does not make a fact in this case more or less likely. I understand Rule 4.1, but that is if it pertains to the case at hand. If it does not involve the charge in question, then it cannot be relevant to the case. This, is, this will not make a fact in the case any more or less likely. And it is clearly just more prejudicial and probative to use evidence from beforehand uh, in, in determining Dr. Schaefer's practice. Um, I'm going to overrule the objection and allow the exhibit to be uh, admitted and published to the jury. Your arguments... Um uh, I think can be further developed on cross-examination if you choose to do so. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Permission to publish, Your Honor. You may. Now, uh, Agent Copeland, in plain language, what jumps out to you about uh, Dr. Schaefer's prescription rates on this uh, document? Can I give a moment for the jury to see this? Of course, Agent Copeland. I think they'll be interested. Yeah, no problem. All right, I could summarize this document for you. A lot jumps out, but if you look in the uh, fourth column, pain away is prescribing rate per 100 patients. Uh, in 2016, that prescribing rate has hit 84.3%. That means that more than eight out of every 10 patients to walk through the doors of pain away are walking out with the prescription for pills. I mean, no matter the clientele you're serving, that, that number is just absurd. Additionally, it's significantly greater than the national average, and this is also during the course of Hadley McAdoo's treatment. And how does this compare to the original Pain Away Clinic? Oh, it's night and day. If you look in the first call or the first row in 2010, 2.6% uh, of Pain Away's patients were being prescribed opioids, and this is despite the fact that they were serving the same community and the same people. Thank you. Now, Agent Copeland, you can put that document aside. Your Honor, permission to approach with what has previously been marked as Exhibit 10? You may. Yes, 
Now, Agent Copeland, what is this document? Uh, these are the physician to patient records, uh, prescription records for 2016 from the Wizzawee Pharmacy and Topiary Shop. And how did you obtain this document? Uh, this document was obtained by subpoena. Uh, it's actually a legal requirement for pharmacies to dispense records for at least two years. And is this a fair and accurate copy? Uh, yes, it is. Your Honor, at this point, I move to enter Exhibit 10 into evidence and publish to the jury. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Thank you. May I publish? So admitted. You may. Now, Agent Co Copeland, what jumps out to you about this document? Again, quite a bit jumps out, but I'll try to summarize it here in the interest of time. Uh, you see, over the course of 2016, Dr. Schaefer has a clear and obvious pattern of prescribing a high dosage of a powerful narcotic to the deceased Hadley McAdoo. Additionally, over the course of 2016, the amount of pills being prescribed doubles from 60 to 120. Thank you. You can put that document aside. Now, Agent Copeland, how do you further investigate the defendant? After I saw these numbers, I knew I had to do some more digging. So I continued to look into their financial records and to closely monitor their prescription practices. I came away with three key pieces of information. First, I noticed that the majority of patients 2015 and 16 were paying in cash. Second, I noticed that they were seeing a greater number of patients than they ever had before, who were really rotating them in and out like an assembly line. Third, more prejudicial than probative to the use of the words assembly line. Your Honor, if I may, it's simply a colloquial term used by this, again, expert in the field. Uh, he would know sort of any red flags like he's uh, referring to. And then furthermore, assembly line, it's not taken to be, it shouldn't be taken literally, of course. It's simply a sort of common uh, analogy used as a, as a way to communicate. What Your Honor, referring to pain away as anything other than a pain clinic is inflammatory to the jury to suggest that it's uh, like an assembly line would be suggesting that Dr. Schaefer did not c conduct good practice at the clinic. And this is just simply inflammatory since they cannot lay foundation for this term. Your Honor, if I may, I believe the jury is uh, not going to, I would hope at least that the jury will not take this literally to mean that pain away was an actual assembly line, simply, again, to communicate the fact that patients were going through fast and many were getting a similar treatment. I'm going to sustain the objection and uh, strike the use of the term assembly line from the record. I think that you can make your point without using that phrase. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. uh, could you continue uh, uh, saying how you further investigate the defendant? Sure. So, uh, like I said, I saw that they were seeing a greater number of patients than ever before. And third, I noticed that several of their patients were actually filling their prescriptions at pharmacies up to 150 miles away. All three of these facts were major red flags in my investigation. Agent Copeland, are you familiar with the term pill mill? Yes, I am. Your Honor, more prejudicial than probative. Uh, Your Honor, if my witness was allowed to uh, explain, he would uh, tell the jury how this is a term often used in drug diversion, which uh, he is a field uh, in which he's a qualified as an expert. Furthermore, again, this is a colloquial term, uh, and as you will hear, uh, it's, a use, it's used often in uh, narcotics investigation. Your Honor, if I may, pill mill is even more inflammatory than assembly line. This is not an expert terminology. Rather, it's just some term that they use throwing around at the DEA. This is simply trying to inflame the passions of the jury. Again, calling it anything other than a pain clinic would be unfairly prejudicing the jury towards my client, Dr. Schaefer. Uh, Your Honor, if I may, any uh, terminology this expert uses, I believe, becomes expert terminology. Regardless, again, simply a colloquial term, but an important one in drug diversion. Your Honor, may I respond? You may. Even if they consider pill mill expert testimony, it could still be inflammatory to the jury to hear, saying, considering that they're con calling Dr. Schaefer's pain clinic a pill mill. And there's been no foundation laid as to how they come to this conclusion, and it's just completely inflammatory. Your, Your Honor, Honor, if I may, if I was allowed to continue, this witness would explain how he came to this conclusion. And I'm going to uh, overrule the objection at this time um, and give the witness an opportunity to answer the question and explain that and lay some foundation if possible. You're free to raise the objection again uh, if necessary. Yes, Your Honor. You can proceed. Agent Copeland, are you familiar with the term pill mill? Yes, I am. Pill mill is a term used by investigators such as myself. It's very common. It describes a practice that uh, distributes powerful narcotics in a matter that is non-medical or unprofessional in practice. And based on your investigation and expert knowledge, did pain away become a pill mill? It certainly resembled one. What further evidence do you have to uh, support that conclusion? Well, once I actually observed Dr. Schaefer and Hadley McAdoo exchanging cash in the parking lot. Thank you. Now moving on, Agent Copeland, are you familiar with the PDMP? Yes, I am, the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. Uh, and what exactly does the PDMP do? Well, it gives doctors a way to uh, know all the drugs a patient is being prescribed by doctors other than themselves. It's, 
incredibly important to ensure they don't prescribe anything conflicting and harm the patient. And how accessible was the PDMP to Dr. Schaefer? Incredibly accessible. You can even do it on your phone these days. It takes Excellent. less than a few seconds. And throughout the course of Ms. McAdoo's treatment, did anyone at Painaway ever check the PDMP? No, nobody did, despite the fact that it was going to be made law in two weeks. It was no secret this was the new normal. And were there any other ways for Dr. Schaefer to find out about uh, Ms. Hadley McAdoo's other prescriptions? Yes, there were. Should, for whatever reason, a doctor elect not to check the PDMP, there's also the tried and true method of urine screening. Uh, did Dr. Schaefer administer a urine screen? No, Dr. Schaefer did not. And finally, Agent Copeland, based on your expert knowledge and opinion, as well as investigation of this case and review of all relevant records, have you come to a conclusion within a reasonable degree of professional certainty about this case here today? Yes, I have. It is my expert opinion in today's case that Dr. Schaefer engaged in drug diversion during the care of Hadley McAdoo. Thank you. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. May I proceed? You may. Good afternoon, Agent Copeland. Good afternoon. You're not a physician, are you? No, I'm a diversion investigator. And so you don't have the ability to prescribe medication? No, I don't. And you've never had to make the determination whether or not to prescribe an opioid to a patient who's been in pain, right? No, I have not. But you would agree with me that some patients do have real pain, right? Of course, some patients do. And an effective way of dealing with that pain sometimes is treating with opioids. Uh, opioids are a powerful but, in some cases, useful weapon. And some patients are simply lying to get medication or doctor shopping, right? Sorry, could you repeat that? Some patients are lying to get medication and are doctor shopping, correct? Uh, that is a common practice among uh, some pill mill clinics. And it's ultimately a judgment call to be made by the doctor to assess what situation they're dealing with, right? Well, yes. And you've said in your own words that a doctor can make an honest mistake when assessing these situations, right? Your Honor, this is from the witness's statement. Uh, Your Honor, just because something was said in the witness's statement does not necessarily make it admissible in court. Your Honor, pursuant to Rule 703, this witness is an expert and is allowed to testify about information whether or not it be deemed admissible. Uh, Your Honor, I have no uh, problem with the uh, expert testimony, rather to opposing counsel's calling for this witness to testify to what he has previously said out of court. Your Honor, again, pursuant to Rule 703, an expert is allowed to testify to evidence that may not be deemed admissible, regardless of if they consider it hearsay. Your Honor, if I may, 703 is not an exception to hearsay. Your Honor, under, for experts it is, Your Honor. Even if an exhibit was hearsay, an expert would be able to testify to this if they would reasonably rely on that information in order to form their conclusions. Your Honor, if opposing counsel is able to point to me where in Rule 703 there's anything about hearsay, I would appreciate that. Your Honor, the rule says that experts are allowed to testify to information that they would reasonably rely on in that particular field, whether or not it be deemed admissible. I don't believe that's what this question was being asked. I believe this question was calling for hearsay. The question... Why don't you ask the question again? Yes, I will. Thank you. And a doctor can make an honest mistake when assessing these situations? Uh, I, I suppose in certain circumstances, a doctor could make an honest mistake. Now, let's talk about your investigation into Dr. Schaefer. You would agree with me that for years, your investigation involved sitting in your car in Painaway's parking lot looking for evidence against Dr. Schaefer, didn't it? Well, in diversion investigation, as I said on direct, it's all about the numbers, statistical trends. So. A lot of the uh, diversion investigation process is sitting and waiting and collecting data. And again, for years, you just couldn't make anything stick. Those are your own words, right? Objection, you're saying. Your Honor, again, this is going directly to the investigation by Agent Copeland. I see it as it's clearly relevant in this case. And again, pursuant to Rule 703, is allowed to testify to this. Your Honor, if I may, if opposing counsel would like to ask whether or not he could make this uh, any, if, whether or not this witness could make anything stick, I have no problem with that. But when he says, uh, you said, that is asking for an out-of-court statement used to uh, prove the truth of the matter asserted. It's his own out-of-court statement? Yes. I, why don't you, the, the witness is available. I think you could ask the, the witness the question. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead. And so you believe that doctors are, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Um, it's okay. You're, you're an expert in this case, correct? I am. And so you've completed a thorough review of all the materials in order to form your conclusions? I certainly did. So you would be familiar with the ambulance support sheet from the night of Coach's death, December 16, 2016, right? Yes, I would. And you were aware that Coach McAdoo was found unconscious and unresponsive in her chair? Yes. And there were multiple pill bottles found around her? Yes. Some of those were from multiple prescribers? I don't know exactly the prescription patterns. I only know what was reported in the ambulance trip sheet was not there. Some of those pill bottles were empty, though? I 
believe that was what was reported, yes. And there was also on the ambulance report sheet a trophy found next to Coach's body, right? Uh, that there's a trophy in the room, yes. Is it, that's a yes to my question? I suppose. Now, let's talk about Coach's medical treatment. You would agree with me that Dr. Coach McAdoo was receiving treatment from multiple physicians, correct? Yes, for different kinds of treatment. Dr. Schaefer for the pain, uh, Margaret Hamburg for uh, the... Uh, Unfortunately, for the Xanax. Your Honor, permission to approach the witness, what has been previously marked to Exhibit 11. Yeah. Would Your Honor like a copy? I have one, thank you. Would opposing counsel like a copy? Yes, please. This is the copy that I will be showing the witness. <clears throat> thank you. Agent Copeland, this is the PDMP log for Coach McAdoo from October 1st to December 16, 2016, correct? Appears so. And you retrieved this document yourself? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, I move to admit Exhibit 11 into evidence. Any objection? Uh, stipulation 22, no objection, Your Honor. Thank you. So I admit it. Permission to publish to the jury? You may. Agent Copeland, we can agree that Dr. Hamburg prescribed Xanax to coach on November 30th, 2016, correct? Yes. And if Dr. Hamburg had checked the PDMP before prescribing to coach, she would have seen an earlier prescription for oxycodone by Dr. Schaefer? Could you repeat the circumstances of that question? If Dr. Hamburg had checked the PDMP before prescribing to coach, she would have seen that earlier prescription for oxycodone by Dr. Schaefer, correct? Theoretically, yes. And you're aware that mixing benzodiazepines such as Xanax and opioids can cause death, right? It can, yes. So Dr. Hamburg obviously never checked the PDMP then, did she? Objection. Dr. Hamburg is not present today in court, nor does Dr. Hamburg have any uh, attorney present, and so I don't believe that this uh, attack on Dr. Hamburg, who again is not present, nor criminal, criminally liable for this uh, for the death of Coach McAdoo is at all appropriate. Your Honor, I am no way claiming that Dr. Hamburg is criminally liable in this case, as I am aware of stipulation number nine saying that uh, Dr. Hamburg prescribed, appropriately prescribed Xanax to Coach McAdoo. Uh, but, however, it does not say whether or not Dr. Hamburg checked the PDMP. And what I'm asking Agent Copeland is if this came across in his investigation. Uh, Your Honor, in that case, I uh, changed my objection to relevance. Uh, whether or not Dr. Hamburg checked the PDMP, I believe, is wholly irrelevant to, again, Dr. Schaefer's treatment of Ms. McAdoo on December 16th. Your Honor, may I respond? You may. The prosecution's burden in this case is to show that Dr. Schaefer didn't act in good faith or in accordance with a responsible segment of the medical profession. This document is showing that there was multiple other physicians treating Coach McAdoo who may have acted in the same exact way that Dr. Schaefer did, going against the burden of the prosecution that she didn't act in accordance with a responsible segment of the medical profession. Uh, Your Honor, as well as my previous objection, I would also like to point out that this uh, document does not, this specific document, does not show uh, who checked the PDMP nor the records of the PDMP. Margaret Hamburg may as well have checked the PDMP for all we know, but again, that is just not relevant and uh, was, uh, should, shouldn't be admissible. I, I'm going to overrule the objection. You may proceed yes, to right. answer the question. And so Dr. Hamburg obviously never checked the PDMP then, did she? I didn't investigate Dr. Hamburg. I have no idea of the circumstances of her treatment. So your investigation didn't come across if she checked the PDMP or not, correct? For Dr. Hamburg? Yes. It was not a course of my investigation of Dr. Schaefer, no. So you're aware that on October 30th, 2016, Dr. Harrison prescribed oxycodone to Coach McAdoo, correct? Yes, I am. And if Dr. Harrison had checked the PDMP for Coach before prescribing, he would have seen an earlier prescription for Xanax by Dr. Hamburg, right? The PDMP laws were not in place at that point, and also there's Agent only Agent Coleman, is that a yes three... to my question? Counsel, I don't understand your question. I'm asking if he would have seen this prescription. It's a simple question. Again, I was not investigating Dr. Harrison, so I cannot make an assumption about what he would or would not have done. So again, this in investigation your investigation is about Dr. Schaefer. So again, in your investigation, you didn't come across Dr. Harrison checking the PDMP, correct? because my investigation wasn't of Dr. Harrison, yes. And you were aware that it would have been legal for all three of these doctors not to check the PDMP at the time, right? Well, it's required for at least once every three months, and it wasn't put in place exactly until 2016. But it wasn't legal. At, it wasn't mandated at the time, correct? At the time, it was not. And you've come to court tonight claiming that Dr. Schaefer didn't act in accordance with a responsible segment of the medical profession, correct? Objection. This witness did not claim that. That was not the conclusion he, uh, he made tonight, or today, excuse me. Your Honor, the witness is here testifying for the prosecution, so he's going to testify towards their burden. It's a simple uh, question to ask the witness. Uh, Your Honor, if I may, he has not testified towards the burden. 
Your Honor, the foundation that the witnesses laid on direct examination went to go to show that they were trying to meet their burden. I'm just simply asking a follow-up question on this. They opened the door on direct examination by asking him questions about drug diversion and whether or not this was in accordance with other doctors. Your Honor, if I may, we were asking about drug diversion, which he's an expert in. Uh, this qu line of questioning is asking Agent Copeland to draw a legal conclusion, uh, which is not his job, nor is he an expert in. Uh, I believe that's the job of the jury, not necessarily Agent Copeland. May I respond? You may. All I asked was if he believed that he came, if he came to court today claiming that Dr. Shaver didn't act in accordance with a responsible segment of the medical profession. That's all I asked, Your Honor. If he believes that Dr. Shaver acted in accordance with a responsible segment, he can simply say that. I'm going to sustain the objection to the extent you're asking for a legal conclusion, but he can answer it um, as an expert in the drug diversion field, which he's already been qualified as. Yes, Your Honor. Agent Copeland, you did not investigate any other medical professionals in this case other than Dr. Schaefer, correct? In the case of Dr. Schaefer, I did not investigate someone other than Dr. Schaefer. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. Thank you. Is there any redirect examination? Uh, briefly, Your Honor. Please. Agent Copeland, were you investigating either Dr. Harrison or Dr. Hamburg? No, I was not. And did Dr. Harrison's opioids kill Ms. McAdoo? No, they did not. And finally, if Dr. Schaefer uh, had checked this PDMP in the last three months, again, what would Dr. Schaefer have found? Dr. Schaefer would have found the Xanax that was being prescribed by Dr. Margaret Hamburg. Thank you. Nothing further, Your Honor. Any recross? No recross, Your Honor. Thank you. The witness may sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Does that conclude the prosecution's case? Uh, yes, Your Honor. The Commonwealth rests, although we do ask for a brief time check before moving on to the defense's case in chief. Thank you. The Commonwealth has 14 minutes, 36 seconds remaining. Um, by my calculation, I don't know if, uh, yeah, we agree. Okay. By my calculation, the defense has 17 minutes, 43 seconds remaining. Okay. Thank you. Is the defendant, are you ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. The defense calls Dr. Ray Schaefer to the stand. Thank you. May I proceed? You may. Please state your name for the court. My name is Dr. Ray Schaefer. And what is your occupation? I'm a pain specialist at my pain away clinic. I attended Temple University for medical school and Calme University for my medical residency. Doctor, tell us, why did you become a pain specialist? You know, I ask myself that question a lot, and I always come back to the same answer. I became a pain specialist because I believe in treating the whole patient, not just their pain. I'm not treating just a leg or an elbow. I am treating a patient's mind and body. My job philosophy is healthy minds, healthy body, and I fulfill this by creating a mutual trust between myself and my patients. Doctor, can you explain what you mean by a mutual trust? Yes, it simply means that I have to trust my patients and they in turn have to trust me. A doctor can only know so much about how their patient is feeling because they have no other way of knowing than the patient's indication. What makes pain away so effective is that my coworkers and I never cave to the idea that we cannot trust our patients. Doctor, how do you treat the pain that lies in your patients? Well, I have one primary approach. It is holistic, similar to Eastern medicine. I treat my patients with methods such as electroacupuncture. Now, if this isn't working to the best of its ability, I do, do turn towards prescription medication as my secondary option of treatment. Doctor, when do you determine if your patients need prescription medications? Well, if my patient still claims to be in pain after these holistic treatment, treatments, I do have to move on to other options. And this is again where that mutual trust plays such a large role because I only prescribe these prescription medications when absolutely necessary. Doctor, was there a common procedure at Painway for checking what medications your patients were taking? Yes. Um, my nurse, Kelsey, would interview the patient and fill out an intake sheet, which would list current medications and uh, pain levels and stuff like that. This is how it's been run since 2010, which is uh, when Pain Away opened. What about checking the PDMP? 
Well, the PDMP had just come out in two th 2015, so it was relatively new and not a legal requirement, but it was sometimes helpful, so I delegated Nurse Kelsey to uh, handle the PDMP. Thank you, Doctor. And now I want to talk about the reason we're here today, Coach Hadley McAdoo. How did you meet this patient? I was first introduced to Coach Hadley McAdoo in January 2014 when JJ Teva referred her to my clinic. It came to my attention that she was suffering from a very serious form of pain, so she became my patient. And what kind of pain was Coach McAdoo suffering from? Well, it's called phantom pain, and not a lot is known about it, actually, at least how to treat it. It has no identifiable cause, so it cannot be targeted through x-rays or CT scans. And although it has no identifiable cause, it is still a very serious, very real form of pain. So how did you help Coach McAdoo with her pain? Um, I first started treating Coach with a combination of acupuncture and lidocaine. Now this was effective in reducing her discomfort, but I decided to prescribe a low dose of an oral opioid prescription to supplement the ongoing treatment. Now, Doctor, I want to make something clear for the members of the jury. Did you use holistic treatments on Coach McAdoo before prescribing her prescription medications? Yes, and the diagnosis was sound, and these treatments were effective in reducing her discomfort. Thank you, Doctor. I now want to fast forward to December 16, 2016. Did you have an appointment with Coach McAdoo on a specific date? No, I, would, I did not. It was at the end of the workday. I was putting on my coat to leave the office, and then all of a sudden Nurse Kelsey burst into the office, practically dragging Coach behind her. Doctor, to your knowledge, why was Nurse Kelsey dragging Coach into your office? Well, I asked myself the same thing until I got a good look at Coach. She was sweating, shaking, and could barely speak. Doctor, tell us, what were you thinking in this exact moment? I was just thinking about how urgent the situation was. I just rushed to help. I scanned over the intake sheet that Nurse Kelsey had previously filled out, and Xanax was not one of the current listed medications. Did you have any other inquiry about Coach's current medications? Yes. I specifically asked Nurse Kelsey, is Coach on any other medications? And Nurse Kelsey said no. Doctor, can you further describe Coach McAdoo's condition while she was in your office? Like I said, she was sweating, shaking, and could barely speak. Then her face further twisted in agony. She began pulling at her own hair, and her breathing became very ragged. Doctor, what does this kind of presentation mean to a pain specialist? Simply put, she was showing clear diagnostic signs of overwhelming pain. So what did you do next? I decided to inject Coach with a shot of hydromorphone, which is a form of opioid. And did this injection appear to help Coach McAdoo in any way? Yes. As soon as I injected the shot, Coach's pain seemed to be eliminated. Thank you, Doctor. Now, as we are aware, Coach McAdoo sadly passed away later that evening. Can you tell the members of the jury what your response was to this? Coach came to me because she was in pain. The pain she was in had no identifiable cause, but that day in the office told me her pain was real. I always do what is in the best interest of my patients, to heal their mind and body. Like I said, that's why I became a doctor. I'm a healer, and I work to heal my patient's pain. Doctor, has anything like this ever happened in Pain Away's history? No. This is the first time anything like this or any overdose has ever happened in Pain Away's history. Doctor, on December 16, 2016, after Coach McAdoo had left your office, were you confident in the treatments you used on her? Yes. I believe I did what any other good doctor would do. I used my medical training, my experience, and my best judgment to assess the situation and determine what was best for Coach and her pain. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. Thank you. Examination? Yes, Your Honor. May I proceed? You may. Now, Dr. Schaefer, when you opened up Pain Away, you opened it with holistic intentions, correct? Yes. And so as a part of this um, holistic treatment, you didn't administer urine tests to your patients, right? No, I did not. I thought it was uh, somewhat invasive, and I wanted to portray this mutual trust between myself and my patients. And at this point, as you said on direct, you were prescribing opioids as a last resort, right? Um, I only prescribed them when my patients absolutely needed them. Right, and your opioid prescription rates were below 10% when you first opened, correct? Yes. And then Hurricane Sandy hit your clinic, didn't it? Yes. And you had to declare bankruptcy, right? Yes, we had a lack of flood insurance, and everything got completely demolished. 
the place we were at, all the equipment, and we unfortunately had to declare bankruptcy. Right, but you were able to reopen the clinic again in Wizzoe, correct? Yes, and I was just happy to be practicing medicine again. And at this point, your opioid prescription rates were significantly higher than the national average, weren't they? Yes, not because my practice changed, but because of uh, the sheer volume of patients who needed them. I was treating people who needed to get right back to work, blue-collar workers, people who didn't have the time to go through acupuncture and lidocaine, people who needed these opioids to supplement them. Thank you, Dr. Schaefer. Now, just to be clear, this is in the same town where your opioid prescription rate was at 10%, correct? It's around the same area, but I was still treating a very different clientele basis. But even though you are now prescribing, almost 80% of your patients' opioids, you still aren't running urine tests, correct? Um, when the practice, uh, when everything happened, I still wanted to keep the same ideals. I was still paying away. I still wanted to have that mutual trust between myself and my patients. Thank you. Now let's talk for a minute about Coach McAdoo. You said you prescribed opioids as a last resort, correct? I said I prescribed them uh, when necessary. So it was necessary to be prescribing her oxycodone for nearly three years? Well, um, Coach uh, had suffered from phantom pain, and I had started off with the uh, acupuncture and lidocaine. And because phantom pain is a uh, mental pain and there is no identifiable cause, it technically cannot be treated with acupuncture and lidocaine, so I did see opioids necessary in the situation. But oxycodone is highly addictive, isn't it? In certain cases, it can be. And you were prescribing Coach McAdoo oxycodone for three years, right? But yes, because I saw it fit in the situation. Now, let's talk about December 16th. Coach McAdoo came in, correct? Yes and you had your nurse fill out an intake sheet, correct? Yes, at a standard procedure at the office. And this is what you relied upon before treating Coach McAdoo, correct? I relied upon Nurse Kelsey filling out the intake sheet and also Nurse Kelly, Nurse Kelsey checking the PDMP. But as you said in your direct, Coach McAdoo could barely speak, couldn't she? Um, she was sweating and shaking and could barely speak. Right, and when you fill out an intake sheet, the patient speaks to the nurse about what is going to be filled out on the intake sheet. Isn't that right? Yes, and that's why I expected Nurse Kelsey to do what she always does and check the PDMP to confirm these medications. But you agreed with Nurse Kelsey that there wasn't time to check the PDMP on that day, correct? Uh, and not that there wasn't time to check the PDMP. When the whole situation said, went down, she said, we don't have time for, time for this. And I took that as, we don't have time for this conversation. You have to trust me to do my job while you take the patient back and you treat her. So you didn't have time for this, but you had time to stop and have the patient sign a waiver that relieves you of liability? It is general practice because of the dosage of the uh, hydromorphone shot. But while she was signing this waiver, you knew the PDMP wasn't getting checked, correct? Um, I relied on Nurse Kelsey to do so. So, just to be clear for the jury, you gave Coach McAdoo a strong shot of hydromorphone, correct? Yes, to relieve her pain. Having never administered a urine test in her entire course of treatment, correct? Again, I thought it was invasive and I wanted to con uh, keep that mutual trust between myself and my patients. And relying on your nurse and the word of the mouth of a patient who could barely speak before giving her that treatment. I Isn't relied right? on Nurse Kelsey filling out the intake sheet, speaking to the patient, and then her furthermore checking the PDMP to confirm the current medications. Just to be clear, you are in charge of pain away, correct? Yes, I am in charge, and being in charge means I can delegate certain responsibilities to people who also work at pain away. Of course, but in the end of the day, you are responsible for what happens at your clinic. Isn't that right? Yes, I am responsible, but I, I can still delegate responsibilities to people who work at my clinic. Of course. Now, Coach McAdoo died of a combination of opioids and Xanax, correct? Yes, and that is true, but when I looked at the toxicology reports, the levels of medication that I prescribed were much higher. But regardless, these were opioids that you were prescribing for three years to Coach McAdoo, correct? Yes, but they were much higher than what I prescribed. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. Thank you. Redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Dr. Schaefer, whose job was it to check the PDMP? It was always Nurse Kelsey's job to check the PDMP mm -hmm. and fill out the intake sheet at the office. Doctor, who filled out the intake sheet on December 16th, 2016? Nurse Kelsey did. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. Thank you. Any recross? Your Honor. Dr. Schaefer, whose name is on the prescriptions that you prescribed to Ms. McAdoo? I prescribed them. All right. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. You can sit down. Thank you, Your Honor. Witness? Yes, Your Honor. The 
defense calls Ms. Sal Abbott to the stand. May I proceed? You may. Please state your name for the jury. Sal Abbott. Ms. Abbott, what is your current occupation? Well, I am a certified financial planner, a certified actuary, and a certified public accountant. And where are you currently employed at? At the Pain Away Clinic, where I am the de facto accountant. What are you able to do as the de facto accountant for Pain Away? Well, I'm able to review, assess, analyze, and determine whether the business is financially stable or not. And what was the financial status of the Pain Away Clinic in 2016? Um, by 2016, the clientele had shifted from celebrities to blue-collar workers, and Dr. Schaefer was working really hard, and all the financial problems appeared to be in the rearview mirror. Is it through your employment that you met Dr. Schaefer? No. Actually, I had a bad fall while skiing in Wyoming in 2008. I broke my collarbone, separated my shoulder, and even tore my rotator cuff. For three years, nothing worked to alleviate my pain. I was in an ocean of pain. And that is when I started to seek out a pain management specialist, and I decided on Dr. Schaefer. Well, what made you select Dr. Schaefer as your pain management specialist? Dr. Schaefer had a really good reputation for using holistic methods to treat her patients. I was also recommended to some other doctors, such as Dr. LeFou Harrison, but I did not want to treat with him since he had a reputation for just giving out pills on the first visit. How long did you then treat with Dr. Schaefer for? For four months. Dr. Schaefer treated me with everything from acupuncture to uh, topical creams to even a very low dose opioid medication. And after those four months, I was completely pain free. I had my life back. I was even back to playing basketball. Treating with Dr. Schaefer was the best decision I've ever made. Now, Ms. Abbott, I'd like to shift your attention to another patient of the Painway Clinic, Coach Hadley McAdoo. Did you know Coach McAdoo? Yeah, Coach wasn't just my friend, she was my role model. Well, how long did you know your role model for? I knew Coach since I attended Wissowee High School. And during our friendship, she taught me so many life values. Well, can you inform the jury of some of those life values that your role model had taught you? Coach taught us that you work hard and you play hard. She taught us to be tough and to never have any regrets. And this is how she lived every minute of her life, at least until she left Wissowee High School at the end of 2013. Well, what changes did you observe in 2013 with Ms. McAdoo? Well, after she left her job, her husband had died of cancer, and she started to complain more and more about her pain. She even started using a walker sometimes. She looked rough. She became a different person, a sadder person, almost a morose person. Well, did you do anything to help her out of this morose stage? Of course I did. I took her out to eat and drove her wherever she needed to go, like to the doctor or to the pharmacy. Is it through these pharmacy visits that you learned whom Coach was treating with? Yes. I learned that Coach was treating with Dr. LeFou Harrison, the same doctor who I did not want treating my pain. So when I heard this, I knew things had gotten bad. Did you ever inform Dr. Schaefer of any of your concerns with Coach McAdoo? No. That was not my place at all. I left it to Coach to tell her physician what she needed to know. I respected her privacy, and I am not a medical expert. Now, I'd like to shift your attention back to your personal relationship with Coach McAdoo. Can you inform the jury of your last interaction with your role model, Coach McAdoo? So, just a few days before she died, I walked her inside her apartment after a pharmacy visit. And it was a mess. There were dirty dishes stacked in the sink, and there was garbage all over the floor. There was pill bottles everywhere, and half of her trophy case was just scattered around. She kicked some debris aside and just collapsed into her chair next to the TV. She tuned me out and was off in her own world. No matter what I would say or what I would do, she just wouldn't respond to me. I hate that this is the last image of Coach in my mind. No further questions, Your Honor. Examination? Yes, sir. May I proceed? You may. Good afternoon, Ms. Abbott. Good afternoon. So, due to your close relationship with Coach McAdoo, you were able to observe a change in her behavior around 2012, is that correct? Um, it was more around like 2013 after she left her job and around the same time her husband had passed away. Okay, so in 2013, you found her passed out outside a bar, is that correct? Yes, it did. 
and more prejudicial than probative. This incident in which co-counsel is referring to happened years prior to the death of Coach Hadley McAdoo and is irrelevant and more prejudicial than probative in the fact that its probative value is substantially not outweighed by the prejudicial value it has. Your Honor, if I may, if I'm allowed to continue with this line of questioning, it will become clear that Dr. Ray Schaefer had ample opportunity to know that this incident had occurred and then proceeded to prescribe opioids to someone who had been unconscious outside a bar. This goes directly to the faith of Dr. Schaefer in treating a patient who was clearly not in a good mental or emotional state. Your Honor, if I may, this incident is not relevant in the fact that it happened many years prior, along with the fact that Dr. Schaefer is the pain management specialist for Coach McAdoo. Dr. Schaefer is not her psychologist or therapist who should be made aware of the certain situation that happened outside of the Pain Away Clinic that could have affected her treatment. Therefore, it's more prejudicial and irrelevant. Your Honor, if I may, this is relevant because this is right at the beginning of Dr. Schaefer's treatment of Coach McAdoo, and any treatment by Dr. Schaefer of Coach McAdoo is relevant to the treatment of her on the day of her death. Additionally, this is not prejudicial, not only is Coach McAdoo not on trial or even in the courtroom today, but this goes directly to Dr. Schaefer's knowledge of Coach McAdoo's mental state while treating the patient, which again goes directly to Dr. Schaefer's faith while treating Coach McAdoo. I'm going to overrule the objection and you can proceed. Thank yes, you. Your yes, Your Honor. So you found Coach McAdoo unfortunately unconscious outside a bar, correct? Yes, I did. She was in her car. And this was in December of 2013? Yes. And Dr. Schaefer, to your knowledge, began treating Coach McAdoo in January of 2014? Yes, to my knowledge, that is true. And you thought, Ms. Abbott, that it would be reasonable for people in Wizzowie to know that this had happened? Well, I just, I noticed this change in Coach, and I wanted to see if other people had noticed it, too. I'm sorry, you may have misunderstood. You thought it would be reasonable for people to know that Coach McAdoo had been unconscious, correct? Yes, I was concerned. And then finally, Ms. Abbott, as the accountant at Pain Away, you have access to their financial records? Yes, I do. You have access to some of Dr. Schaefer's financial decisions about Pain Away? Yes, I do. And while Dr. Schaefer was treating Coach McAdoo, Coach McAdoo was running for re-election for city council, right? Yes, that is true. And Ms. Abbott, you were under the impression that Coach McAdoo wouldn't win because her condition was so poor. Relevance to Coach McAdoo and running for re-election? Your Honor, uh, Coach McAdoo's condition while running for a city council is relevant because Dr. Schaefer would have been aware of her condition. As Ms. Abbott had just stated, people in Wizzowie are aware of each other's lives. And so if Ms. Abbott, excuse me, if Ms. McAdoo was running for city council and her condition was known to be poor, that goes directly to how Dr. Schaefer chose to treat her with knowledge of her poor condition. Your Honor, if I may, counsel cannot establish what these factors were that applied to the reason that she was acting out. They could have been stressed due to her, re due to her uh, election for campaign, along with the fact that this has no, does not make any fact in tonight's case more or less likely and is not relevant. Your Honor, if I may, I didn't state that Coach McAdoo was acting out. I didn't, in fact, state anything about Ms. McAdoo's behavior. I simply asked Ms. Abbott whether or not she was under the impression that Coach McAdoo's condition was deteriorating. And since she has already stated that it would be reasonable for Dr. Schaefer to know that she had been passed out outside a bar, it would then be reasonable for Dr. Schaefer to know that her condition was deteriorating. Your Honor, if I may, then I'd switch my objection to this question is calling for clear speculation by my witness. Your Honor, since the objection has been switched, I would argue that since Ms. Abbott just said that people in Wizzowie are aware of each other's lives, this does not call for speculation. That's a very detailed calling for speculation. It's a very detailed and a very precise accusation to make. Therefore, this speculation is not rationally based on any perception. Your Honor, it's not very detailed whether or not Coach McAdoo's condition was known to be deteriorating, especially by someone who had a close relationship with Ms. McAdoo. I'm going to sustain the objection now. Um, you are free to develop or try to establish more foundation and ask it again um, without prejudice to you raising that objection again. And, Your Honor, pursuant to 611E, I ask to strike any testimony referring to this. Granted. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor. So, Coach McAdoo ran for re election for city council while she was being treated by Dr. Schaefer. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And, Ms. Abbott, you were under the impression that Coach McAdoo wouldn't win because her condition was so bad. Is that correct? 
prejudicial than probative and relevance. We just established that any factor of the stress that might have been exhibited by Coach McAdoo for the selection is not relevant in tonight's case. Your Honor, I'm not referring to Coach McAdoo's stress. I'm referring to her condition that would have been well known to the people of Wizzawee during the treatment of her by the defendant. I'm going to allow the question overruled your objection. Yes, Your Honor. Would you like me to re-ask the question? Yes, please. So, you were under the impression that Coach McAdoo wouldn't win because her condition was so bad, correct? Yes. When she was elected, she was the old version of Coach, and she had this personality switch, and as she was running under this new Coach, she was not as she used to be. Right. And this was while Dr. Schaefer was treating her, correct? Yes. This was also after she left her job and her husband had passed away. Okay, but just to be clear, Ms. Abbott, you already said that it would be reasonable for people in Wizzawee to know a fair amount about each other's lives, correct? It's, a it's been answered. It's been long established, this fact. Your Honor, I'm just clarifying for the jury. I'll allow it overruled. It's a fairly small town, so everyone kind of knows everybody else. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Redirect? No, Your Honor. The defense have a final witness? Yes, Your Honor. The defense calls Dr. Rye Haight to the stand. <laughs> may I proceed? You may. Please state your name for the jury. Good afternoon. My name is Rye Haight. And are you a medical doctor? Yes. I'm a practicing physician specializing in pain management. Briefly summarize your educational background for the jury. I received a bachelor's degree in biology from Harvard in 1989 and both an MD and a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1995. And have you received any specialized training throughout your career? Yes. Following an internship and a residency, I participated in a fellowship in neurology and pain management. How many years did you study from the beginning of your collegiate career to the end of your fellowship? Sixteen years. Dr. Hay, please explain pain management for the jury. Well, pain management is a medical approach that uses science and alternative healing to study the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of pain. Now, doctor, we've talked a lot about your educational background. Would you briefly summarize your professional experience for the jury? I'm the founder and director of the Sackler Clinic of Medical Pain Management. I've also been a clinical professor of medicine since 2001. And do you routinely make decisions about whether or not to prescribe opioids to patients who are reporting in pain? Yes, I've dealt with these decisions a countless number of times. They're a major part of pain management. Your Honor, at this time I offer Dr. Rye Haight as an expert in pain management and the prescription of opioid medication. Any objection? Uh, no objection, Your Honor. This witness is amply qualified. Thank you. So admitted. Yes, Your Honor. Dr. Haight, you're an expert in pain management. Would you be able to give the jury a black and white definition of pain? No, I cannot. Pain is subjective, and unfortunately, even with all of the advancements the medical profession has made over the years, we still have no machines or devices that can objectively measure pain. If we suspect that a patient has a broken arm, we can x-ray it and objectively see if there's a fracture or not. If we suspect that a patient has cancer, we can order a CT scan and objectively see if there's a tumor or not. But this is not always the case. Oftentimes, we physicians see patients who are clearly in pain, but we are unable to identify a precise cause. We call this idiopathic or phantom pain. Well, what role do opioids play in treating this pain? Opioids are very powerful medication for treating pain. While I respect Agent Copeland and his commitment to ending the opioid epidemic, there are many cases in which opioids are absolutely necessary. Medication like oxycodone allow people in crippling, debilitating pain to function again and attempt to return to their normal lives. Who is in the best position to make the determination whether or not to prescribe an opioid to a patient in pain? The treating physician. They're the ones who spend the most time with the patient and understand them the best. They have the training and experience to make an informed decision. Doctor, explain some of the obstacles a physician might face when treating with opioids. Well, as a professor as well as a doctor, I know that there is a difference between hypothetical textbook situations and real-world experiences. It's easy for me to stand in front of a classroom and teach about different scenarios, but that's no substitute for real-world situations. 
oftentimes doctors have to make snap judgments when a patient comes into their, into their clinic in obvious pain. And that's why it's so important for a doctor and a patient to have an honest and trusting relationship. That's something that goes so far beyond what can be taught in a classroom, and it's a decision that only the doctor can make. Doctor, what materials have you reviewed in this case in order to form your conclusions? I reviewed all of the case materials, including the intake sheet from December 16, 2016, the PDMP log, and the statements of Ray Schaefer, Fran Kelsey, and Royal Copeland. Doctor, in your professional medical opinion, was it appropriate for Dr. Schaefer to administer an injection of hydromorphone on December 16, 2016? Yes, this was the right choice of medication because Coach had exhibited a new level of pain known as breakthrough pain, or pain that is breaking through her other medications. Well, in your professional medical opinion, was the dosage of this injection appropriate? Yes, this dosage was 100% legal and FDA approved. Was Dr. Schaefer required to check the PDMP before prescribing to Coach? No, this was not a legal requirement at the time, and from the start, Dr. Schaefer was disadvantaged because Coach did not mention that she was on any other drugs like a benzodiazepine, also known as Xanax. And from my review of this case, I have seen that Nurse Kelsey did not mention that any other drugs Coach was taking other than what was listed in the intake sheet. Have the physician's requirements when treating with opioids changed over recent years? Yes, of course. The world of opioids and the monitoring of these drugs have been in a state of constant change over the last few years. And what may be a legal requirement today may not have been less than a year ago. That was the case with the PDMP. Well, at the time, was Dr. Schaefer required to order urine screening for Coach McAdoo? No, and to this day, it's still not a legal requirement of physicians. In addition to this, there was not many significant risk factors present in Coach, such as family history of abuse. And doctor, in your professional medical opinion, in your professional medical experience, do patients normally exhibit physiological signs of pain? Yes, patients who are in pain exhibit typical signs of this, including panic demeanor, a sweaty skin, or they're even reduced to tears. From my view of this case, Coach exhibited many of the typical signs of a patient in pain on December 16, 2016. Dr. Haight, have you formed an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as an expert in pain management and the prescription of opioid medication? as to whether or not all of Dr. Schaefer's actions in her treatment with Coach McAdoo were in accordance with the accepted medical standards at the time? Yes, I have. And what is your opinion? Dr. Schaefer was not required to check the PDMP before prescribing medication. She was not required to conduct urine testing, especially because there was not many significant risk factors. And she administered an injection of hydromorphone that was FDA approved. All of these actions by Dr. Schaefer and Coach's case were 100% appropriate and medically acceptable. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. Thank you. Cross-examination? Uh, yes, Your Honor. May I proceed? You may. Good uh, afternoon, Dr. Haight. How are you doing today? Good afternoon. Now, I'd like to talk briefly about a few things you said on direct. Um, first off, you said that you were educated in pain management for 16 years? Yes. Uh, but that's not true, is it? Well, that includes my fellowship and my internships. Uh, I'm sorry, but I believe you were actually, including that, you were only educated for 12 years. Isn't that true? Your Honor, may I see a copy of what this uh, opposing counsel is referring to? Of course. Sure. Uh, this one is marked up, but uh, I have the uh, exhibit. It's uh, Exhibit 9. Okay, the we have a copy of it. I just wanted to know. Thank you. Yeah. So isn't it true that you uh, were actually only educated for 12 years? Well, that includes my internships, my fellowships, and any other jobs and instruction that I completed. Right, but education, 12 years, not 16, correct? Well, I include fellowship in my education. That's included in the 12 years. I don't mean to get hung up on this, but... Objection, I've just been asked and answered. I don't believe it was answered or asked. It, it, um, I don't believe it's been asked and answered, clearly, at least. Um, I'm going to overrule your objection, but ask that you rephrase your question as well to clarify course, what's yes, going on here. Uh, Thank you. Just to clarify, again, uh, your education at Harvard began at, in 1989, and you completed your fellowship in neurology and pain management in 2001, so that's 12 years, correct? Yes, yeah, so I guess including education, but I include my job instruction, any other instruction I received in that year's. That's fine. Just clarifying for the jury. And uh, next, you said something on direct. You said that the uh, medication Dr. Schaefer prescribed, you believe, was the right choice, correct? Yes, I do. But don't you believe that that injection was a mistake? Well, it was probably not the best practice at the time, but since it was FDA approved and was when, within the legal limits, her prescribing this medication was certainly not criminal or bad in action. Right, but you believe it was a mistake, correct? 
It, yes, but again, it was not certainly not criminal for her to do this because it was FDA approved. Okay. Now, uh, Dr. Haid, I'd like to briefly talk about some of your uh, from some of your work experience. Uh, now, you've given a talk previously advocating against the restriction of the prescription of fentanyl, correct? Yes, I have. And who sponsored that talk? That was Purdue Pharmaceuticals, but they only sponsored this talk. Um, it was they asked me to come and give my unbiased opinion. I was not paid for this talk. It was just me informing the community about opioids. But they didn't only sponsor for you that talk. They've sponsored you on other occasions, correct? Yes, they have. But I was not paid for these talks. I was asked to give my unbiased opinion. You were sponsored, correct? Yes, but not paid. They just sponsored the event. You were sponsored, but not paid. They sponsored the event, not me. Okay, and furthermore, you've given a talk uh, advocate, uh, excuse me, uh, stating your opinion that opioids are a tool maligned unfairly? Yes. Thank you. Now, on to the day in question. Coach Hadley McAdoo walked into pain away presenting with extreme pain, correct? Yes, she did. She exhibited many of the typical signs like sweaty skin and shaking. Right, but the signs of extreme pain are similar to those of withdrawal, uh, excuse me, withdrawal or drug abuse, correct? Yes, they are, but again, this is for the doctor to determine. They use their training and experience, and Dr. Schaefer concluded on this day with the signs that Coach presented that it was, in fact, pain because the signs are very similar. Right, but Dr. Haight, there were risk factors that pointed to Ms. McAdoo abusing drugs, correct? Yes, but again, this is for the doctor to assess if um, these risk factors, it's a cost-benefit analysis. Dr. The doctor Haight, these risk to. factors... In the witness is allowed to finish the answer. Uh, Your Honor, the witness is entitled to a brief explanation. I believe she was going on a bit. Um, I'm going to uh, sustain the objection, let her finish her sentence. We can revisit this if it becomes a, well, another issue. Yes, sure. It's a cost-benefit analysis. Again, it's for the doctor to determine if the risk factors are worth prescribing opioids or not. Right. And these risk factors included the fact that Ms. McAdoo was a long-term opioid user, correct? Yes, it did. But Dr. Schaefer did determine with her training in this case that the benefits of the opioids would outweigh this risk factor. Right. And the fact that Ms. McAdoo was paying in cash, correct? Well, she did not pay in cash all the time. She didn't use her insurance as indicated on the PDMP right, log. Right, but her paying in cash, however often it happened, was a risk factor, correct? Yes, it was, but she didn't do it all the time. Thank you. And despite these risk factors, Dr. Schaefer neither checked the PDMP nor did a urine test, correct? No, she did not. She did conduct the intake sheet. And again, she believed in that trust and bond between the patient and the doctor. And since all these things were not legal requirements at the time, her not doing so was certainly not criminal. Right, they weren't legal, but you believe that it was not good practice to do neither of these things, correct? No, it was probably not the best practice. Um, but again, um, since all these things were legal requirements, Dr. Schaefer was able to do these. Many other phys physicians did do this, so it was certainly not criminal for her not to do these things. Right, now with regards to the PDMP, you believe it's one of the most significant medical innovations of the past 10 years, correct? Yes, I do. It tells a doctor what other prescriptions a patient has, correct? Yes. And had Dr. Schaefer checked the PDMP, he would have found that Ms. McAdoo was on Xanax, correct? Yes, she would have, but since this is a very new technology, Dr. Schaefer still relied on her intake sheets, which was very common practice for the PDMP, came into place in 2015. Right. Now, Dr. Haight, we've established that Dr. Schaefer neither checked the PDMP nor did a urine screen, but did Dr. Schaefer at least ask directly whether or not Ms. McAdoo was on Xanax? No, but she did review the intake sheet, in which she had delegated to her nurse, and nothing was listed on the intake sheet. And Dr. Haight, had you made a mistake, like not asking directly about benzodiazepines, you would be horrified, wouldn't you? Yes, I would, but I don't believe this is Dr. Schaefer's failure in this case, because she had reviewed the intake sheet, which she had delegated to her nurse. Right, but you'd be horrified had you made a similar mistake, correct? Yes, but I don't put this on Dr. Schaefer in this case. And finally, Dr. Haight, as Dr. Schaefer's prescription rates trended above the national mean, you believe that it's impossible to rule out explanations that are criminal, correct? Yes, but it's also impossible to rule out um, explanations that are not, including that her prescription rate went up because she was treating blue-collar workers, which are workplace injuries that need more opioids. But just to be clear, Dr. Haight, it's impossible to rule out criminal explanations, correct? Yes, as well as she was treating blue-collar workers. Nothing further, Your Honor. Any redirect? No redirect, Your Honor. Thank you. You may sit down. Thank, Thank you. you. Does that conclude the defense case? Yes, Your Honor. At this time, the defense rests. Thank you. Are the... Uh, Parties ready to proceed with closing? Yes, we're good.
May it please the court, opposing counsel, members of the jury. You may recall that in her opening statement, my co-counsel Lauren Palmer spoke to you about people facing very difficult situations, using their training and experience to assess their surroundings and form their best judgment on how to proceed. I ask, who among us is willing to second guess the decision of a firefighter racing into a burning skyscraper? Who among us is willing to second guess the decision of a soldier driving a vehicle down a foreign road? Who among us is willing to second guess the decision of a pilot flying a jet that loses engine power? On December 16th, 2016, Dr. Schaefer faced a very difficult situation. Using her medical training and experience, she attempted to alleviate her patient's pain. Her motive was compassion. Her judgment was consistent with the standards accepted by a responsible segment of the medical profession. The death of Coach McAdoo is very unfortunate, and we may debate whether or not Dr. Schaefer provided the best care, but Dr. Schaefer's actions are clearly not criminal. Now, members of the jury, fairness dictates that you should not judge my client with the benefit of hindsight. Examine Dr. Schaefer's actions under the circumstances that she faced at the time, under the certain medical laws and procedures as they existed at the time. Now, the prosecution has the burden of proving to you beyond a reasonable doubt their criminal charge. Think of reasonable doubt in this way. As you're leaving your house in the morning and you're pulling out of your driveway, you question whether or not you blew out that candle in your kitchen. You stop, you hesitate, but ultimately, you go back and just to double check. That is reasonable doubt. And if at the end of tonight's deliberations you have any reasonable doubt, you must find Dr. Schaefer not guilty. Members of the jury, let's look at what evidence the prosecution failed to provide you tonight. The prosecution, which has the burden of proving to you beyond a reasonable doubt that Dr. Schaefer either acted in bad faith or not with accordance with responsible segment of the medical profession, provided no testimony from any physicians. The only two doctors who testified here tonight was the defense expert, Dr. Rai Haight, and the defendant herself, Dr. Ray Schaefer. Prosecution also failed to provide you with an autopsy report with any blood testing. Now, it is undisputed, and we agree, that Coach McAdoo died due to an adverse interaction between Xanax, prescribed by Dr. Hamburg, and opioids prescribed by Dr. Schaefer. But members of the jury, ask yourself, what are the levels of either drugs found in Coach McAdoo's body when she is deceased? Now, the defense has no burden of proof. Yet we presented three witnesses tonight. First, you heard from Dr. Ray Schaefer, who told you on December 16, 2016, Coach McAdoo came to her showing extreme signs of breakthrough pain. Sweating, shaking, and even pulling at her hair in pain. Her motive was to alleviate her patient's pain. Next, you heard from Sal Abbott, who told you Dr. Schaefer's financial problems, portrayed by the prosecution as some sort of evil force compelling her for cash flow, were well behind her by the second half of 2016. And last but not least, you heard from Dr. Rai Haight, a leading pain management specialist for the Commonwealth, who told you Dr. Schaefer's actions were perfectly legal and within a responsible segment of the medical profession. Now, members of the jury, I ask you, pay close attention to the circumstances surrounding the death of Coach McAdoo. On December 16, 2016, Coach McAdoo was found in her apartment, slumped over in her chair, Surrounding her body were pill bottles, different prescriptions by different doctors, most of which were all empty. By her body, a trophy, a symbol of her former yet distant glory. I ask, what do these circumstances tell you about the death of Coach McAdoo? Members of the jury, the opioid crisis in America cannot be solved by unfairly targeting a well-meaning physician. Like a firefighter, a soldier, and a pilot, Dr. Schaefer used her medical training and experience to relieve her patient's pain. An act of compassion is not a crime, and the evidence presented to you tonight compels you to return a verdict of not guilty. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. For the prosecution? Yes, ma'am. May I proceed? Yes, you may. Your Honor, opposing counsel, members of the jury, may it please the court. Today you have heard the case of Ray Schaefer, a pain management specialist charged with drug delivery resulting in the death of a, of a beloved high school basketball coach named Hadley McAdoo. 
Now, the Commonwealth had the burden of proof in today's case, which means we needed to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that in treating Ms. McAdoo, the defendant either did not act in good faith or acted in a manner not accepted by a responsible section of the medical profession. And we are confident that when you review the evidence presented today, you will conclude that we have met that burden by showing that the defendant was under too much pressure, prescribing too many opioids, and taking too few precautions. Let's review that evidence. You heard Ms. Kelsey tell you that, <coughs> desperate to restart her clinic, the defendant began prescribing more and more opioids while still refusing to conduct urine screenings. Ms. Kelsey told you that she saw the defendant exchanging cash with one of her patients. And Ms. Kelsey told you that on the day of Coach McAdoo's death, the defendant banished Ms. Kelsey from the office, refused to check the PDMP, and sent Coach McAdoo on her way with yet another potent prescription for opioids. And hours later, Coach McAdoo was dead. Now, the defense would have you judge Dr. Schaefer based on the circumstances of that day. We agree that you should, because the circumstances of that day are that Dr. Schaefer was after financial gain and ignored all red flags when treating Coach McAdoo. What evidence does the defense present? The testimony of Sal Abbott, who told you herself how obvious Coach McAdoo's poor condition was. They expect you to take the word of the defendant herself, who somehow thought that she should rely on the word of someone who had been prescribed an addictive substance for three years and was in so much pain she could barely speak. The defense emphasized that we didn't call a physician today, but members of the jury, how much worthwhile is it to call two physicians, one of whom stands to go to prison if they lose, and one of whom has worked on behalf of the opioid industry on multiple occasions? Dr. Haight herself admitted that she would be horrified if she had treated Coach McAdoo the same way Dr. Schaefer had. Now, the defense wants you to draw a smokescreen using Dr. LeFou Harrison and Dr. Margaret Hamburg. But all of these pills, these hundreds of pills that could have killed Coach McAdoo, were prescribed by the defendant. Dr. Schaefer's name is on the prescription, and Dr. Schaefer's name is on the docket. Do not let them distract you by blaming doctors who are not on trial today. Compare that with the evidence of our witnesses. Not only did you hear testimony from Ms. Kelsey about the defendant's increasingly suspicious behavior, but you heard detailed testimony from Agent Royal Copeland, who showed you that while treating Coach McAdoo, pain away's prescription rates were 30 percentage points higher than the national average. This is a sure sign of a doctor hungry for financial gain, and Agent Copeland was the second witness to relate Dr. Schaefer's cash exchanges with patients. And you heard from J.J. Teva, who told you that despite the defendant's bankruptcy, her lifestyle and spending habits never changed. This is a sure sign of a doctor who is running a cash business, borne out by the fact that the defendant referred to a patient as a cash flow. Does that sound like something you would want your doctor to do? Does that sound like something a responsible doctor with her patient's best interests at heart would do? Of course not. Members of the jury, today you have a duty and an opportunity to hold Dr. Schaefer accountable for the tragic and preventable death of Ms. Hadley McAdoo. Because Dr. Schaefer was under too much pressure, prescribing too many opioids, and taking too few precautions. And despite what she might have said on the stand, one overdose at her clinic is one overdose too many. We are confident that when you review the evidence presented today, you will find for the Commonwealth and find Dr. Schaefer guilty of drug delivery resulting in the death of Hadley McAdoo. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Um, I ask the audience to join me in giving these teams a round of applause. <laughs> and at this time, I'm going to excuse the jury uh, and please rise.
good. Thank you. You may be seated. Do any of the, do any council have any um, resolutions that you need to bring to the court's attention at this time? None, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, this gives me, I know, I know you are all exhausted, I'm sure. It's been a long few days and a long season. Um, I am not sure how much of my bio uh, was included before I came out, but 18 years ago when I was a law clerk uh, following law school, I got my start uh, with mock trial as an attorney advisor uh, for a high school team. And it was about 17 years ago then that I was in this courtroom as an attorney advisor um, for a state final rounds. And that was a really exciting time. I've lived um, through the attorney advisor role this experience. And it's extremely nerve wracking, um, but extremely exciting and extremely fun. And I have to say, you, you are phenomenal. And I know the work that goes into this, not just with the students, uh, and the witnesses and the attorneys and the timekeepers and the entire team, but students, I think we should turn around and give your parents and your teachers and advisors and teammates. <laughs> this is this is a program that runs on on volunteers, not just through the bar association and the young lawyers division but through teachers who give extra time to their teams and parents who get you guys there and uh, attorneys who help support you uh, with, with, with legal issues and preparing your cases. And uh, I can tell you that in my experience for you guys to get here, I know that you devote as much time to this activity as any athlete does, as any uh, uh, others uh, of any other school activity does uh, and so you really deserve a lot of credit for for the work that you put into this this is an extraordinary effort um, this subject matter I have to say is some of the most timely case uh, timely mock trial cases I've seen over the years uh, I sit in, in federal court and in the middle district of Pennsylvania and we see unfortunately uh, tremendous uh, numbers of, of, of opioid cases, uh, the, uh, and it's very difficult. Uh, I, I, you know, fortunately, I get to sit here in a neutral position because I think the decision to prosecute or not prosecute these cases and, and who the defendant should be on them is, is a developing area. Uh, it's, it's challenging, and it's certainly a crisis that is, is in our, our Commonwealth now, and I thought the subject matter was very timely, very sensitive, and hard uh, for uh, uh, high school students to address, and you all did so phenomenally. Um, your handling of objections on all sides is wonderful. You guys were, were prepared and poised, and I have to say one of the challenges of being uh, in this role is that it's hard for me not to go back on Monday morning and look at counsel in front of me and say, why don't you know the rules of evidence as well as some of these students do? <laughs> um, I'm reminded of when I, from when I was in practice that often um, that you, know, you have the uh, good luck, if you want to call it that, or the fortune of being able to focus on this one case over the last few months, whereas most counsel hopefully have more than one case that they're focusing on. Um, but that, that notwithstanding, your grasp of uh, the rules of competition, of the rules of evidence, and of the case material which is, is just outstanding. So uh, congratulations to all of you for getting this far. Uh, you guys did a absolutely phenomenal job all around, um, and you should be very proud of yourselves and uh, of your teammates and of your support. Um, I believe it's time for you guys to uh, talk to each other and get your best advocate and best witness certificates together, and then we'll exchange them.
uh, the prosecution. Do you want to present your awards? Uh, we are presenting the Best Advocate Award to Elizabeth Arby. And the Best Witness Award to Gianna Sicchetti. Your Honor, we'd like to pre present the Best Advocate Award to Chloe Smith-Frank. goes to Sarah Miller. Well, thank you. I don't have any other comments. I'm happy to entertain any questions not related to the substance of the case. But um, otherwise, we can wait for the jury to come back, and you guys can talk among yourselves. So enjoy. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank, thank you. The jury is back. Its verdict will be the winner of the state competition. I just want to make that clear. The jury verdict is the winner of the state competition. Your Honor. Thank you. Has the jury reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. We, the jury, find in favor of the defense. <laughs> Thank you.